All right, hello again. You get to hear from me another time. I'll teach one more time and then that will be it. But I'm doing it a lot here at the beginning. So we will finish up the introduction in this section about revelation. You can know the future. So uh, my friend Owen, he went over a few of the details about John. We're going to go over a few other details about the book and who it was written to. First, though, let's look at some key terms that are found in the book of Revelation. There's a lot of different terms, but the best term to start off with is what does the title Revelation mean? What does Revelation mean? Perhaps one of you knows. In ancient Greek, the word for Revelation was the word apocalypsis. Now, that might sound kind of familiar for any of you who are familiar with the English word apocalypse. It's a kind of sci-fi term that we use, and usually it's talking about something like a zombie apocalypse or the end of the world or something along that measure. So it kind of makes sense that this word would mean the Greek word for revelation. But in Greek, the word apocalypsis kind of had a different meaning. It's kind of uh, morphed over time. The original meaning of the Greek word apocalypsis did not convey final destruction, but rather the unveiling of a curtain or to like lift something, to show the future. The Greek word apocalypsis, revelation, is a key term. The term does not convey the idea of final destruction, as many modern dictionaries imply. It means to unveil or to cause to be discovered. And this makes sense, because in Revelation, what are we studying? We're studying the future. We're unveiling what is going to happen. We're learning about what is going to happen in the future. So this title, appears, the key term occurs only once in the book of Revelation. In Greek manuscripts, it is the first word in the book. It is key since it describes the whole book in one single term. Lots of books in the Bible we kind of gave titles to afterwards when the church fathers put it together, but Revelation has its own title. It starts out with this word, apocalypsis, in Greek. That's what the book is about. We can see that through the book of Revelation, God desires to communicate and reveal several important things about the future to the church of Jesus Christ. Throughout history, we can see that God has communicated with man in order to inform him of uh, concerning the future. Communication from God is grace and action. And we know this because recently we celebrated the holiday of what? Christmas. And that was about a very important prophecy of Jesus' first coming. There's a verse in Isaiah. There's many other Old Testament verses about it. And now we're going to be studying the second coming of Christ. In amazing wisdom, during a span of about 1,600 years, God used the tool of writing by means of human instruments, prophets, starting with Moses and the author of Job, to record and meticulously guard his message to mankind. So God speaks through people, but the words are still from him. And that's important. As we looked about John, who Owen mentioned, you know, on an island, wrote this book, we want for you to remember this was not John's ideas. This was not John's personal beliefs or opinions at all. Yes, he physically wrote down the book, but the words are God's. So we want to make that clear. John, you could say, is the writer. I guess God is the author in a way. He's, the words are from him. This degree of communication sets true Christianity apart from world religions, even though many religions have tried to copy God's wisdom and method by writing their own versions of sacred text. We talked about this earlier, the importance of the credibility of Scripture. From the beginning of creation, God has communicated directly to mankind using various methods, dreams, visions, audible voices, angels, or the writings of the prophets who wrote under inspiration. And we call this direct form of communication special revelation. It would be wise for us to pay close attention to God's recorded messages, including the book of Revelation. So that's what revelation means. Um, now we're going to go over a few other key terms that you'll see a lot throughout the book. The first is lambs. The word lamb is a key term. It appears 29 times in the book of Revelation. It is the term by which Jesus is most often referred to in this book. It keeps us mindful of the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. This is important. There's a lot of people, um, some pastors, a movement in America, people who say that we shouldn't study Revelation because it takes away from Jesus Christ. And they say this because the word Jesus Christ, that his name, that is not found in the book of Revelation. You're not going to see that. 
But what's important is it doesn't mean that the book isn't about Jesus. In fact, the entire book is about Jesus. Rather, he's referred to as the title of the Lamb of God or the Lamb. So yes, Jesus is throughout the whole book. He's mentioned 29 times, even if his name is not there. Rather, it's this title. And we know this is talking about Jesus. Uh, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Um, in the Old Testament, Jesus was spoken to as the Lamb. Um, this is a title that is used throughout the whole Bible to refer to Jesus. The term throne appears 47 times in Revelation, reminding us that someone who is absolutely worthy is going to ultimately rule forever. Next, let's look at some important numbers that occur a lot in Revelation. The number 24 occurs six times and always has to do with a group of elders seated on thrones in heaven. The number 10 occurs nine times. When this number appears in the text, it usually refers to a federation of nations which will arise during the tribulation. And we'll get into all these different uh, concepts like the tribulation and stuff as we go through them. Um, the number 12 appears 23 times. Virtually every time this number is mentioned, it is in a context related either to Israel or to New Jerusalem. And the number four appears 23 times. This number is used with regard to the four living creatures that are on God's throne and in relation to some judgment-bearing angels, the wind, or the four directions of the compass. The word seven, a lot of times, is found 55 times throughout Revelation. Um, this is a common number throughout the whole Bible. Generally speaking, throughout Scripture, seven is the number of completion or finalization of something. God ceased from his work and rested on the seventh day. You know that from the story of Genesis and the creation of the world. Seven is when God rested. It's kind of how it is throughout the rest of the Bible. And finally, a number that you've probably heard of before is the number 666. It's an important number. It only appears once in the book, and we'll speak of this number in more detail later. It's kind of an important concept. And care should be taken not to read too much into numbers, the so-called doctrine of numerology, unless the context makes it plain that the number is indeed significant. And this is really important. A lot of people get hung up on this, and it's kind of weird. They'll take like mathematical formulas and then try to apply them to the Bible and decipher all of the words and then try to come up with something. And through this, a lot of Christian groups have predicted events in Revelation, like, oh, the end of the world is going to be now or now. I, I don't know, probably in your circles, this wasn't a thing. I, I remember in 2011 when a lot of people said the world was going to end. There's been a lot of these people. Um, I think by now most people don't take them seriously because of the fact that they predict the world over and over and over and over again and it's never right. I mean, you know, I don't want to brag or anything, but this is like the fifth end of the world I've survived. <laughs> so it's important not to get into this. We're going to study the Word of God. There's nothing in the book of Revelation that says we should try to apply math to the Bible and try to predict when the end of the world is going to happen. In fact, in Matthew 24 and many other verses, it says that no man or even an angel is going to know when the events of the end times are going to take place. So in other words, we don't know. And in fact, it's kind of funny. Um, there's been other, like when the, I think it was the Mayan calendar ended, a lot of people thought the world was going to end then. A friend of mine asked me what I thought of it, and I said, I'm actually more certain than ever that the world is not going to end today because the Bible says that no one knows when it's going to end. So if it did end today, then the Bible would be wrong. So I'm like, I'm actually, it's not ending today. I'm like positive of that. So there's no reason why we should do this. In fact, it's anti-biblical, so it still floors me why so-called Christian groups would try to predict when the world's going to end when the Bible says we shouldn't do that. We won't be doing that in the study. So here's some important scriptures, some popular or key ones that we'll find. Revelation 1.3 says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the word words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. This one's cool. No other place in the Bible in a book does it say that you'll be specifically blessed for reading it, but it does in Revelation. So who likes to be blessed? That's right. No one likes to be cursed. Don't wake up your friend early in the morning loudly. <laughs> Rather, come to this conference instead and be blessed because the Bible says you will be blessed, not by us, but by God. 
Revelation 1.19 says, Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. This is a very key verse. It's kind of the outline verse for Revelation. If you've ever maybe done a speech or an essay before, you lots of times have three points. And those are like your outline. And then you'll go and your entire letter or essay will follow those three points that you give in the beginning. That's what Revelation 1 19 is. It says, write the things. This is Jesus speaking to John, which you have seen. Jesus is showing John a vision. And then he says, write the things which are and the things which will take place after this. And that's what the whole book of Revelation is going to follow. First, it will talk about what Jesus looked like when he was speaking to John. Then it's going to talk about the current state of the churches that the book is being written to. And finally, it's going to tell us the majority of the book about the end times. Revelation 2, 7 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To he who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This is another cool verse. It says, he who has an ear, listen to this book and what the Spirit says to these churches. So I'm looking out, and no one is earless right now, which is good. So listen to what Jesus has to say to these churches, if you have an ear, because it's important information. These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are him are the called, chosen, and faithful. And that's an example of how Jesus is referred to in the book as the Lamb. It's very clear that the Lamb is talking about Jesus, Lord of lords, King of kings. No one else is the Lord of lords and King of kings except for him. Revelation 22, 7 says, And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who hears the words of this prophecy, the prophecy in this book. So who was this book written to specifically? The book was written to seven specific churches in Asia Minor. Asia Minor is the modern day place of Turkey, not to be confused with the animal, but the country of Turkey. When you look at the location of these churches on a map, they make somewhat of a circle. They're actually pretty close, although in ancient times they didn't have modern transportation, so it would have been, I guess, far for them. But they kind of make a circle in the modern-day country of Turkey. Pergamum, Smyrna, Ephesus, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So, yes? Oh. Yeah, that works better. Okay. So one of those went away. All right, let's see. So yeah, those are the seven churches that the book is written to. Even though these churches were very different from one another, they existed simultaneously. And these churches, as we go through them, it's really interesting, are very different from each other. Lots of times one church will God will say, You're doing great at this, but you're doing bad at this. And then the other church will be the exact opposite. So it's important to see what different churches struggle with and what they're good at and how we can learn from them for our churches. These seven churches may typify the basic types of churches that exist during this dispensation. It is likely that your local church can be identified with one or more of these churches. Some Bible scholars see the churches in Revelations 1 through 3 as representing different stages in the present-day church dispensation. A dispensation is like a, a time age. We have like the Old Testament dispensation. Now we have the, the uh, church age. Um, so many people think that it represents like a, a, dif- a dispensation or an age. Some scholars would say that the order of the letters to the churches corresponds to the flow of church history. They date different eras of church history, calling them the Ephesian church age, the Philadelphian church age, the Laodicean church age, etc. While this may be interesting to consider, we feel it is speculative and should not be taught dogmatically since there is no suggestion from the text of Revelation that we are to interpret these churches as being periods or eras. Rather, we do know that these churches did exist. They were real churches. These were the real problems, and God was addressing them. So we can learn from those churches, but we're not going to interpret it as God specifically talking to our church or a certain age, although we should learn from it for sure. The apocalyptic nature of the book of Revelation. As we said earlier, Revelation means to unveil or uncover information about the past, present, and future. Revelation is the only book in the New Testament that is classified as prophetic, 
there are a few prophecies um, throughout other parts of the New Testament, but that's not what the majority of those books are, whereas this is what the bulk of Revelation is, prophecy. More than one half of the book deals with the coming tribulation. So we'll be learning about a lot of punishments and terrible things that will happen to the world. And then the Greek title of the book is Apocalypsis, conveying the idea of removing a veil and making what is hidden visible. The implication of this title is that Revelation is meant to be understood by common folks like you and me. So I'd like to congratulate everyone who is here. Pat yourself on the back. Because a lot of people are scared of Revelation. I've even found that like, just talking to people, telling them about this conference, they're like, oh, really? A bunch of teenagers are going to read Revelation? It's like the scariest, most confusing book in the Bible. Why would you do that? But that's because God says, he who has an ear, listen to this book. You will be especially blessed if you read this book. God really cares about this book. It's an important one. And the word of God is made for us all. There's no reason why we can't understand it. I think we can. And in fact, God will give us the help. He, if he wants us to do this, which he says he does, then he will help us to do it. The revelation is not for Bible scholars only. It's for everyone. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, just read this if you're really smart. It says the Bible is for all people. There is a lot of symbolism or figurative language in the book. Daniel, Zechariah, Ezekiel, and others also use similar symbols and terminology of those written here. And while you read Revelation, to me it sounds a lot like some of the Old Testament books. It kind of has that style. Um, so you'll find that interesting. There is not a direct quote from the Old Testament in Revelation, but it has been estimated that 285 verses have Old Testament inter, uh, have like Old Testament overtones. So in other words, there's not a direct quote from like Ezekiel or whatever, but it uses a lot of the same titles, a lot of the same examples, figurative language, talking about things like the temple and the lamb and other phrases that are used throughout the entire Old Testament. And it has that kind of same prophetic style. In total, Revelation contains 22 chapters, 404 verses, and 12,000 words. Of the 404 verses, 70 verses mention angels. So if you like angels, you picked a good book. The book of Revelation follows its own outline as stated in Revelation 1.19. Therefore, write the things which you have seen, that's chapter 1, which speaks of that which John has seen in a riveting vision of the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. The second part of verse 19, the second part of our outline, in the things which are. And that would be chapters 2 through 3, which speak of that which was happening at the time of the writing of Revelation. These things apply to the present church age, but were principally or originally written to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And finally, we have the third point in the things which will take place after this. And this is chapters 4 through 22, which speak of that which will yet occur in the future. So maybe you knew this before, but up until chapter 4, we don't actually get into predictions about the tribulation and the destruction of the world and those types of things. That's going to come in chapter 4 and beyond. The first three chapters are about some other really cool things. And then we'll only go through chapter 11. So you'll have to come back. And, you know, no one likes to only read half of a book, especially when it's as interesting as Revelation. So I'm sure we'll all want to finish it. So now we're going to look at the different interpretations of Revelation because a lot of people have different ideas about it. And we'll go over the four most prevalent interpretations, and then we'll explain which interpretation we're going to use this week. So first, there's the allegorical or idealist view of Revelation. Defined, the idealist view is that the book of Revelation is an extensive allegory to be interpreted non-literally. Does everyone here know what an allegory is? Pop quiz. Does anyone here feel confident enough to share what they think an allegory is? Yes, Caleb. <coughs> it's a story that's supposed to All right. That is basically what it is. An allegory, a little bit according to the definition, would be also, it teaches a story, but everything in the story represents something greater. So yeah. But that's basically what it is. So if you have an allegory, you know, for example, Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory. It's teaching a bigger story. So that's what a lot of people think Revelation is. They don't think, no, this is not going to happen. Christ is maybe not coming again. The tribulation is not going to happen. It's just 
supposed to teach us something bigger than what it says, literally. Generally speaking, those who hold this view contend that the book of Revelation is a symbolic account of the struggle between good and evil. So basically, it's just really vague. And a lot of people who have this idea don't exactly agree on what the allegory is. They just believe that it's an allegory and that it means something bigger than what it literally we would take it to mean. This way of interpreting scripture, and especially the book of Revelation, originated in an ancient Alexandrian school of theology in Egypt, beginning with teachers such as Clement of Alexandria and Origen, and that was back in AD 150 to AD 450. This non-literal way of interpreting scripture later greatly influenced church leaders like Augustine and Jerome, men who greatly impacted church dogma and Bible interpretation for the next 1,000 years. All right. And there was a lot of church leaders after that who have hold, held this prominent view as well. So is there anything wrong with interpreting the Bible this way? Yes, there is, because it is a subjective way of examining and studying scripture. It not only allows the student to interpret scripture as he or she feels moved, it discourages finding the actual meaning. And that's the big problem with interpreting Revelation allegorically, is that it could mean literally whatever you want it to mean. If it's an allegory, then who knows? Maybe you think that the candlesticks in Revelation remind you of the candlesticks in your room. So you think that it has something to do with that. Or who knows, there's just a bunch of, if it's an allegory, what exactly is the allegory? Because the Revelation doesn't say that this represents this overall, rather it gives a specific event. So if you are going to interpret it this way, it's entirely subjective up to what you think and want it to say. And that's really scary because we should try to interpret the Bible according to what the original intent is, not what we want the scripture to say to fit our preconceived ideas, beliefs, and morals. With allegorical interpretation, the student assigns arbitrary meanings to figurative language, which then becomes very subjective and even dangerous. So that's the first one, the allegorical. Does not understand it literally, sees revelation as the whole span of the church age, assigns arbitrary meanings, and this is also the Catholic Church's way of interpreting revelation um, historically as a whole. So now we're going to move to the second part, or the second view of interpreting revelation. Defined simply, this view is that most of the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled during early church history. So people who hold this view think that, oh, almost everything in the book that we're studying has already happened. The word pretor is the Latin word for past. Some preterists or preterists, I don't know how to pronounce that, claim that Revelation was essentially fulfilled prior to the time of Constantine in AD 312. Other people who hold this belief believe that it was all fulfilled even earlier in AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Generally speaking, those who hold this philosophy conclude that Revelation depicted a symbolic history of first century Christianity. So people who hold this view also view Revelation as highly symbolic as well, which really shouldn't surprise us because if we look at Revelation, it describes events such as a third of the ocean becoming blood, a third of ships being destroyed, the entire world being controlled by one government, everyone being forced to have a mark on their body, and also four angels pillaging the earth, killing a third of the population in a day. Those things have not happened. I mean, there's no record in history of a third of the ocean being blood or angels coming down and killing a third of the world's population. So in order to you know, fit their ideas with the fact that this, none of this stuff has happened, they also kind of interpret it allegorically as well and say, well, it doesn't mean that a third of the ocean is actually going to be blood or that all of these people are going to die. Maybe it was just talking about a specific plague or a specific amount of people dying in this one small area or something like that. And to answer this question, is the book of Revelation a set of future prophecies yet to be fulfilled or a prophetic book that was already fulfilled? They would basically say that it has already been fulfilled. Now this next slide here is really weird. I did not make it, and I don't know why it's up here. <laughs> it's really creepy. I think Jamie put it up. No? Pastor Brad? Someone did it, and it's weird. It freaked me out when I was studying. So is there a problem with this? Yes, there is, because this view ignores the book's own testimony about itself. 
Revelation 1.3 says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep the things which are written in it, for the time is near. It is a prophecy, and the time is near for its fulfillment. This wouldn't make sense. Why would John write a book saying, this is going to happen in the future, if it had already happened? That would be like if I told you, hey, Taco Bell's giving away free burritos for free today. And then you went and found that that deal was actually two years ago. I'd be an awful friend, and there'd be no reason for me to tell you that. Why would God predict something about the future in, if it had already happened? Yes, there is, because this view ignores specific predictions about future events concerning Israel and the church that have not yet happened historically, as you will see. Also, this view erroneously forces the book of Revelation to have been written prior to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by General Titus, which is contrary to the historical records of the early church. So in order to fit their interpretation with the problem that John wouldn't write something to people saying it's going to happen in the future if it's already happened, people who hold this view try to go against the church records, what the early church recorded as the date of Revelation, trying to claim that it was written a lot earlier in order to fit with their idea that it happened before the destruction of the temple. But the church records are very clear. As Owen went over, he read you all of the early church witnesses who tell us when the book was written. All of them say that it was written in the time frame of about 90 to 100 AD. This view holds no consistent explanation for the symbolism found in Revelation and denies the future rapture of the church. This interpretation does not give a clear way of the future and effectively removes the purifying impact that a belief in an imminent rapture provides. Revelation is not supposed to be frightening if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, I would think that would be very frightening. But if you are a Christian, God writes it to you to encourage you. You're going to win in the end. God's side is going to win. You're going to have an eternity with him. But if you don't believe in these events, you don't believe that the rapture is coming, that Christians are going to have you know, an eternal state in heaven, that God's going to finally give the judgment this world deserves, then it removes this hope for Christians. Um, instead of, oh, it's already happened. We're just going to be stuck here in a cycle, and you know, the rapture is not coming. This interpretation tends to view Israel with content because it sees no biblical future for the Jewish people. So since according to these people, all these prophecies have already been fulfilled, God doesn't really have a plan for the Jews any longer. They're not necessary. So a lot of people um, historically, especially who have been anti-Semitic, have also held this view because, you know, they don't think the Jews are important because the uh, prophecies have already been fulfilled. So this sees most of Revelation as being fulfilled already. Um, some think it was fulfilled before Constantine and 312, and most think it was fulfilled when the temple was destroyed in AD 70. Next is the historical view of interpreting Revelation. This view says that the book of Revelation is merely a symbolic snapshot of church history between the first and second coming of Christ. So in other words, this view is similar to the last, except that it thinks that these events happened later than 312, maybe during like the medieval ages times, anywhere between the first and second coming of Christ. The historicist views Revelation as a symbolic prediction of church history from the first century to the second advent of Christ. This interpretation of Revelation claims that some of the prophecies have already been fulfilled in church history in events like the fall of Rome, the Reformation, the French Revolution, etc. This just really, to me, doesn't make sense. As you read Revelation, nothing in there is talking about the French Revolution. There's no way you can even try, in my mind, to connect those two things. We're reading about massive destructive events of the world, things that have never been recorded in history. And historically, these interpreters tend to declare that a certain pope, the Catholic Church, or some world leader, like a Roman Empire, was the Antichrist. This view is held by many post-millennialists who believe the world is going to get better and better, and eventually we will usher in the kingdom of God. This is a very large growing movement. So these people think God's not actually coming back to set up his kingdom. Instead, it's up to us. We're going to start the perfect millennial kingdom of God, and the world's going to get better and better until it becomes perfect, um, and we'll have the kingdom here. But this is contrary to Bible scripture, which tells us that the world's actually going to uh, to eventually get worse, which will come and bring upon the end times. 
With this view, no two interpreters consistently agree as to which passage refers to which event. Typically, they try to show the fulfillment of many passages of Revelation in their own generation. So people who hold this view probably don't hold the same opinions. They all have a different idea of what this meant and when it was fulfilled. That's because of the fact that it's very unclear since these events haven't been fulfilled yet. But these people will especially try to point to, oh, this is happening right now. This was predicted here in Revelation. Um, try to see it in their own time frame. So it sees Revelation as a symbolic history between Christ's two coming, assigns arbitrary meaning, and this is held by most post-millennialists. The last view of Revelation is the futuristic view. From the beginning, John said, for the time is near, and him who is, and him who was, and him who is to come. These phrases and passages clearly indicate we should take a futuristic view. This view allows for a literal or normal interpretation of the text of Revelation, certain that all of these predictions will actually be fulfilled. An important point to note here is that just because you believe Revelation is a futuristic book doesn't mean that you throw out all symbolism. It understands that there are many symbolisms that must be carefully and accurately interpreted by comparing scripture with scripture. What you do when you have this view is you agree that there are symbolisms, but you're not going to arbitrarily assign meanings and say that something is a symbol unless the Bible makes it clear that it is. For example, we talked about the lamb being mentioned in Revelation. It's not subjective to say that the lamb is talking about Jesus. It's very clear. But we're not going to say that the churches, for instance, represent modern churches today, because that wouldn't be clear. It doesn't make that clear in other contexts in the Bible. This view offers a relatively clear and universal understanding of the principal events that will be fulfilled, while realizing that many of the smaller details are often sketchy. This view sees chapters 1 through 3 as referring to the present church age, while chapters 4 through 22 are still future. People who oppose this view of Revelation say that it wouldn't comfort us in the present if the book of Revelation was a largely futuristic book. To me, this doesn't make sense. If you're a Christian, knowing that this is going to happen in the future, I think would be comforting to us. On the contrary, accurately knowing the future based on the sure word of God does indeed bring great comfort. When understood from the futuristic view, Revelation creates an important expectation that gives us both purpose and hope. So we've gone through these interpretations, and this is very important, because when you talk to a lot of people about Revelation, there's a lot of different opinions. So we'll be using the futurist view. It interprets Revelation literally, sees Revelation as being fulfilled sometime in the future, and gives us great comfort. So here's kind of a basic overall bullet points of these four different ideas. And also, here's some teachers I don't know, if you are into teachers, um, some famous like pastors and stuff, and the different views that they have. So in this study, we will interpret Revelation using the futurist interpretation. In this study, we will follow a literal hermeneutic. Hermeneutics is a technical word meaning Bible study methodology. We will follow a literal, normal, and grammatical approach to interpreting this book of Revelation. This means that we will understand scripture literally by interpreting the figurative language based on definitions found in the immediate context of the scripture. When the interpretation is uncertain, we would not arbitrarily assign meanings, concepts, or ideas, but will rather indicate our uncertainty as to the exact meaning. You'll hear that a lot this week. If something's a little unclear, the Bible maybe doesn't make it exactly clear, we'll say, here's what some people think about this, here's another idea, you know, the text doesn't make it exactly clear. We're not going to just say, oh, it's definitely this. We don't want to assign arbitrary meanings. We would prefer to say we don't know than to give an arbitrary meaning that may be plausible, but is not substantiated by the text or related passages. So I said earlier that we will be using symbolism, but only if the context makes it clear. So I'll give you in another example. I gave you the example of the Lamb of God, referring to Jesus. But another example of symbolic language defined by a related passage would be in Revelation 1.12. John says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. So you might be thinking, what are the seven golden lampstands? Well, if we go and flip over to Revelation 1.20, it says, And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. 
So from, because of this verse here and this other context that makes it clear that this is symbolic, talking about the seven churches, and any other verse in Revelation where it mentions the seven lampstands, we're going to assume that it's talking about the seven churches. We believe that wherever God deemed it necessary for us to understand, he clarified the meaning in the text of Scripture. Our job as interpreters is to carefully study and compare Scripture with Scripture and thus come to learn its meaning. We will consistent, consistently distinguish between the church and Israel throughout this study. There will be times when you may not agree with our interpretation. We would encourage you to be good Bereans and study the scripture for yourself to see if things are true or not. If you find our interpretation wrong, go with scripture. So for sure, throughout this week, none of us are perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm sure some of the teachers, and we'll be seeing for a long time, will probably say something that maybe is not true. You know, maybe Alex. But one of us will. And the point is, you're supposed to go with what the Bible says. We're asking you to hold that highest. Not our opinion, but the word of God. So we'll hope that this week, that we as the teachers will be teaching through the word of God, and therefore will be teaching the truth. And we're asking God to help us do that. But we don't claim to be perfect in any way. So study the Bible for yourself always and find out the truth about it. So with that in mind, I'm going to close off with a word of prayer that God would just give us the strength and the wisdom as we study this book. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be able to come and study your word. Thank you for writing the book of Revelation, for also claiming that you will bless us because of our study of this book. I pray that you would give us the wisdom to understand it, and also that this book would impact our lives, that we would understand that you are coming and because of that hope that we would be motivated to stand strong and to trust in you and to not get depressed or stressed or weighed down in this world, but to know that something better, something so much better, is coming very soon. In your name we pray. Amen.